Greetings. Carlito. I see you. This is a presentation today about the uh, clan guidelines, rules, regulations, and all, why they are important to us, even now, even today. No. Of course, it's from the Kusa Nation and the Kusa State. And also the former label, rather, the old CNNA USA. Before I get into that, you know, and I'll be reading from my notes today, yeah, because if I had to do this off the top of my head, like I normally do, it would take me about, maybe, about four hours to cover it all. But I'm going to make this very short. But this is a brief, basic introduction of what these clan rules, regulations, guidelines, statutes, ordinances, and all that, what it means to us today, you see, and everyone else too, you see. It's what our laws and all are made out of, and what they're based on, and what should be applied to us right to this day, you know. But before I get into that, I have here the laws of the Creek Nation, was written by Chili McIntosh and his first cousin, Governor George Jim Troop of Georgia. And this was a switch or revising of a lot of our clan laws things of that nature. In other words, to write the Negro out of the picture, to write Indian Negro out of the picture, period. And you have to look at Chili McIntosh's father, who is William McIntosh. You know, the real McIntosh, you know, the color, black, Negro looking one, you know, you know, and you can see how hilarious it was, but it had tragic consequences too. You see, but it's just like they, like he, Work the Negro out of the, out of the, any benefits and all in, in the Creek Nation, in, in the third and twentieth law, and then wrote the Negro right back in in the third and twenty second. It all depends on how you look at it and interpret it and all. Um, on the other hand, the restoration of our clan, man and tribal practices, customs, rules, codes, and all, was done by principal chief. Lego C. Perryman in 1867 1890, and that's approximately the Muscogee Tower, that constitution. And it was edited, I think, by Mr. A. C. McKellar. So, these are the reasons why these things are, are important to us. You know, um, you also have to remember that what we call the Kusa Tower. Or the Muscogee Creek Tower, our constitution. It was the first constitution that the colonists copied here, as evidenced by the Articles of Confederation here. I'm sure you remember those. Um, and that's why in the Articles of Confederation, uh, before the United States Constitution, that's why no mention was made of slaves, Negroes, nor Africans. There's a reason for that. But, however, let me get into this because I want to make this a short introduction, a short and basic introduction. I, again, I'll be reading from my notes today. But if I had to do it again off my head, I would read the shoot. I would, we would have been a four hour lecture discussion, question and answers, and the whole thing of it. Um, but this is how these clan rules, guidelines, regulations, codes, statutes, and ordinances that make up the laws of our constitution, which is called the Tawa, T-A-L-W-A, the Tawa. In fact, everything about us is Tawa, and I'll address that in, a, in another section here. Um, the Tawa is important to us as an indigenous American Aborigine, or what they call a, a black Indian or copper colored Aborigine. There are many other names that people use as well, you know, FBA. Some use Afro Indigenous and all. Most Aborigines, copper color Aborigines, do not use that. And that's something I'll address too in another section here. Again, this is a very short introduction. And it's also to clear up a lot of misconceptions and a lot of information that's been put out by a lot of people. Some people 
pretending, you know, or, or faking to be the, the Kusa or the original Kusa and all of that. And other people, you know, some people doing it out of ignorance and some people doing it for gain. But this will, this should clear up a lot of things. And your people are basic, again, a basic introduction to just what these clan rules, customs, laws, practices, code, statutes, and ordinances really mean that make up our constitution and all. So, this is how these the, the clans, rules and regulations, you know, this is how they apply to you in everyday life and in, every, in everything, you see. This is also how the tall our actual constitution applies to you, to everything you do. And like someone read from my notes, you know. You see. So, how the tower applies today to everything you do, it being a, a compilation of all your practices, rules, codes, and customs, your ordinances and statutes, you know, your clan, your band, and tribal laws, as well as those of, of your uh, matriarchal heart, you know, your clan mothers, and even the medicine persons, or those that they call, you know, the religious or spiritual leaders of our people somehow. You know, this was also an issue in the Muscogee and the Creek U.S. Treaty of Peace and Friendship in 1790. And it was also an issue in the Cherokees too. Their Treaty of Peace and Friendship with the United States in 1791. Um, that's Hopewell. You know, which was in 1785. And Holston in 1791. Yes, the Cherokees and the Muscogee, they had treaties of peace and friendship with the United States, not just Morocco, Britain, France, Spain, and other people that we've heard. Uh, and our sovereigns were the first ones to even recognize the United States here on this soil. We're not talking about Britain, Spain, France, and all of them, even after their wars and all. You see? And we need to remember some things too that when we're talking about these five civilized tribes, there are actually seven of them. We have the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, um, you know, Scobies, and some of those. You also have the Natchez and the Nietzsche. They were not included for a reason. Here, yeah, again, you know, as I was telling you earlier about you, Chile McIntosh and his cousin, Governor Troop. And Troop County, Georgia is named after Governor Troop. Just like here at Lumpkin, Georgia. My hometown in Lumpkin County is named after Governor Lumpkin. All of these were, were congressmen and governors of the state of Georgia who instituted um, Negro erasure and Indian removal. That's original Negro erasure and, and Indian removal. You see, there's a long history of this already leading up the wall to play, you know, and others, several others, you know. But the um, the manner that this that these clan and band laws attract applies to us, you, me, and everybody else, is in every way possible. When I say everything, I mean everything. And again, I'm gonna read from my notes here. Well, this is in response to questions too that people have asked me. The serious questions that people have asked me. Sincere people, old and young people. Who, who have any inherited you, you know. And so when I say these clan rules, guidelines, regulations, statutes, and codes that they apply to us in every way and everything, I mean everything. Like in civil unions or marriages, male and female relationships, zoning, your land and property rights, taxes, tax liens, civil jurisdiction, criminal justice and jurisdiction, Rules, regulations, and guidelines of any departments, agencies, bureaus, corporations, and their charters and bylaws. Medical institutions, whether hospitals or clinics, etc. Insurance companies, all financial matters, including guaranteed income, wages, long-term long -term income, such as stocks, bonds, investment futures, your 401ks, and any other financial arrangements of any types. That includes currency, barter, trade, selling, etc. on our land here. All of our businesses, whether they're mom and pop, whether sole proprietorships, S corporations, LLCs, LLPs, companies, nonprofits, 
community development corporations, including housing authorities, uh, community financial development institutions, such as our banks, or their banks, any one of them, credit agencies, mortgage, real estate, savings and loans, etc. All educational institutions, you know, such as those of pre-K to 12th grades, vocational, and even all social services of all types, including defects, family and children interventions, police and school resource officers, juvenile courts, VA, Medicaid, Medicare, SSI, SSDI, pensions of all types, business licenses, IDs and proper identities, etc. And everything else that you can think of, you name it. You see. And one of the things I want to address it, that is why these religious, racist, slavery, colorism, and supremacist doctrines that were backed by mobs, police, sheriffs, militias, and courts were used in colorism also. These things were used as a cover to deprive us of our government. If you don't have a government in your own indigenous government and you're ruled by other people, you're really not counted among all the other nations of the world because you got somebody else speaking for you. And when people can put you under their religion, then they can practice what they call supremacist issues on you because they can say that, you know, you're under their religion and they can treat you in, in what we have experienced here. Let's just say, you know, non-human, sub-human, and sub standard treatments and all. You see? And that's one of the reasons why. You see? On the other hand, we need to understand one thing here to get out of this religion, racist, slavery, colorism, supremacy doctrines that have been enforced by private citizens, mobs, police forces, different groups and organizations and all. But we are an ethnic group of people. We are not a racial group of people. We are not all the dark skin, brown skin, red, yellow complexion people in the world, in this country, or even on all the other continents. Sure, we are all human beings. We are all part of the human species and all the, the humanities in general. But we are our own group of peoples in the humanities. And all other peoples are theirs. That's why we have to break this colorisms, religions, races, and supremacist doctrines. Especially for us. Those of us who call themselves copper colored aboriginals or indigenous Americans are those who use the terms. Uh, Native Black Americans. Uh, how will you explain this? I'm saying this here without any bias, hate, prejudice, discrimination, or judgmentalism here at this time. You see. And when we talk about a lot of these religions and racist supremacist stuff, you have to remember one thing: those among us who have those bloodlines, whether well, colored Europeans. Our more Jew, Hebrew, Israelites, and West Africans, all of that. And remember, you're using their doctrines, Bible, Torah, Quran, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, our more Jew, and Hebrew, Israelites, and all that. And even they don't even say that, that they're every people in the world or that every other people is them, based on any of their skin complexions. And we know among our Moors and Jews that they have just as many complexions as we as the indigenous, copper color, Aboriginal peoples here do. You know, those of us that they call so called black Indians or the original black Indians of America. You see, we're an ethnic group of people, we're not a racial group. But we understand why we were taught that for so long. And that leads us to what's called, as an ethnic group of people, self government and self determination. In political terms, it's called decolonization. You see? And it's concerned our human, our ethnic, and our land rights here. Instead of having to fight people all day long like our ancestors did over civil rights, or to get civil rights in our own homeland. You see? You see? One of the things of, of restoring our own government, you know, or bringing it out of, out of insolvency, which has already been done, is you have to remember we are dealing then with a nation state entity, not just a clan, band, or tribe. 
That way we get out all this, you know, the stuff that's been going on about who's clan, who's band, who's tribe is more supreme or superior than somebody else's. You see? If you look at the Kusa Alliance, which is an indigenous nation state sovereign entity, an indigenous pre existing, aboriginal, primordial, primal nation state entity known as the Kusa Alliance. The Natchez or the Muscogee Federation. And then again, the Creek Confederacy. Which is what the Kusa Nation, the state of Anacusa, that's what we're based on. That's what we founded this on. In the words of the of the foreigners here, for instance, we have here what's called the Kusa Chief Dome and the Kusa Alliance. And it was a chief dome state. As you know, you have Kusa, Tuscaloosa, Kofa de Chequi, Okudi, and Wara. So the chief dome state is not a matriarchal state. When we say matriarchal, we mean matrilineal and matrilocal. Because you take the identity of your mother and her clan, and that gives you your rights and privileges and immunities with everyone else like the whole pre-confederacy, all the other clans, bands, and their tribes. You see? And as it is now with everyone else here, all other peoples here, they say the least about it. When you look at the, um, the observations of St. Jean de la Kruger in 1804, mm -hmm. he describes us as a Federal Republic. If we look at the observations of, of course, you know, I've heard of him, Mr. John Stewart, the British Superintendent of Indian Affairs, and the Colonial Governor of Florida, Mr. James Grant, his name was, they explained our system as such in 1764. And you have to remember the Kusa Alliance, the Muskoka Natchez Federation was reorganized into the Creek Confederacy in 1717 AD. But their observations from at that time, at that time, in 1764, was that the towns, he's talking about the Tawas. There were towns called the Tawa. In fact, our whole system is called the Tawa. He said the towns may be considered as so many different republics, which forms of one state when he says one state, he's talking about one state. Not like states of the union, but a state, like a nation, a country. So, but each of these towns has separate views and interests. And if that sounds similar to the system we have today, with these departments, agencies, with these bureaus, with these cities, towns, and counties, and these states of the union, if it sounds similar and, and familiar to that, it is. It's the same thing. And our chief dome state was called the League of the Muscogees. You see? The next thing I want to get into here, in this short, short, short brief introduction, is our constitutions. We have the Muscogee Tower, which constitutes the codes and all through the regulations, again, are pulled from our clan systems. And we also have what's called the Great Law of Peace. That's of the Iroquois Federation, better known as the Howard and Confederacy, and they're also known as the League of the Iroquois. And we understand we have the, the Lenape um, and the Powhatan Paramounts up in the north, in the northeast, you know. Okay, many people have went around and represented the Great Law of Peace and said, well, that's a national constitution. Well, let me explain something. Georgia has a constitution that's recognized by every other state. But you wouldn't go to Nevada and try to use Georgia law or any code, rule, or regulation, or statute here. You see, the Great Law of Peace is a national constitution that applies to Iroquois peoples. Their tribes playing the bands, you know, from their sacrum chiefs and all, in their territories. You see, to us, the Great Law of Peace, the United States Constitution, and even the State of Georgia Constitutions. 
These are treaty documents to us. Listen. They're treaty documents to us. And these include all these state constitutions as well. Because they'll come out from our treaties with the colonial powers and the United States. And so we see now why the removal of our government was done and why it was done with such issues as race, religion, color of violences, compulsory education. You know, we have to be constantly taught that in the schools, in the churches, in the mosques, you know. You see, it gives other people a supremacy, foreign people supremacy over an indigenous group of people, so to speak. See, it's, it's made a reality from, you know, being back, you know, by war and terrorism, mobs, police, you know, militias and all this type of stuff, you see. And it's called the law of the land. And while we're in this, in, in that type of state, that mental state, that's what they represent us, you know. And these indigenous aborigines, they represent, you know, couple color aborigines to other nations, the United Nations. In way, it's, you know, you know that these people are slaves there, you know. They're on the, you know, race, religion, codes and stuff like that. You know, they cannot think for themselves. So, you know, we're, we're overseeing their land and their resources and everything. Okay, when you begin to make them apply our clan, customs, practices, rules, regulations, guidelines, and all, you see, and their codes, and statutes, and everything that they deal with us with, then you break that. That's what's called breaking out of the matrix. You see, that means that wherever you're at now, in the southern region, in the neighborhood, city, community, town, locality, and all right. And your people are from that area. That's that clan. Rule, regulation, guideline, the customer practice that applies to you and everything that I just named. See? Now, there's another doctrine that applies here. It's called the doctrine of respondent superiors. And you go to my notes again. I will tell you, because we're dealing with agencies, departments, bureaus, groups, sex, cults, organizations, associations, and institutions that people are hiding behind with their colonial rules and regulations, the doctrine of respondent superior applies here. Since what we are dealing with comes from the top, it comes from the top of these agencies, whether corporations, cities, county, states, private businesses, whatever. And that's what we're dealing with. And, and, and that's the saying, you know, as I always like to say, it's the old folks say. It's all coming from the top. You see. So those are some of the things that I just want to go over with you all. In a very, very, very brief little, little podcast here. So that we can begin to get back into making these claims. Practices, custom, statutes, ordinances, and rules of law and regulation apply to us everywhere in everything we do. That's the business of the Kusa Islands, uh, present Kusa Islands, uh, which is the literal here of the nation state entity known as the Kusa chiefdoms and its other chiefdoms up under it, in which these clans, bands, and tribes live themselves at, at any type of system that was a federal republic with these confederated democracies among them. You see, this is the political and economic foundations and bases of it. And applies to us in a whole lot of things that applies to everyone else too. And all the foreign peoples and all. That's basically all that I have to present right here today. And I want to thank you for your time. And thank you for listening. You know, if your time is important to you, it's important to us too. Let me check right here, see that I missed something here. I pretty much covered it all. But this was supposed, was supposed to be just what it, what it is now. There's a short, 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 brief talk. 
and a basic introduction to the foundations of what those of us who are representatives of our people, so whether we're hereditary chiefs and officers, or whether we've been elected by the peoples in the area that you represent, you know, and you're familiar with them, and you're from that area. This is something that we, you know, have to really start applying immediately. In fact, the Kusa Nation, the state of the Kusa, we've already been doing that, and we will continue to do so. Of course, though, we have to reorganize our executive council and legislative council. They go together. And we do that, of course, from the, you know, those who are hereditary chiefs, clan mothers, medicine persons, chiefs, you know, tribal administrators, people of that nature, you know, people of that status and standing, both old and young. That's what makes it official. So the restoration of, of our government and the restoration of our executive council and all that, those are the most exciting things that are going on for us today in any shape, form, or fashion. And again, there's a lot to be said, too, about what I'm saying here. You know, and there's a lot more that we be addressed, you know. I just want to get to that today. It's like I said, there were some things in my mind over the last two or three days. There are people who have, you know, old and young who, you know, asking me questions here and there, you know, about certain things, about this copper colored Aboriginal thing, this foundational black American thing, this Afro Indigenous thing, and, 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 and what's really going on. I will say this, though. For those of us who are colored Europeans, you know, and just get somewhat into the slavery issue, you know, those who are colored Europeans, you know, whose roots trace back there, West Africans, or Arab Moors, you Israelites, Moriscos, you know, you all in our community should help straighten this matter out. Not only for us indigenous uh, American Aborigines, or indigenous black Americans, I'll go ahead and use that term now, or the original black Indians, because we are a population that went through everything that everybody else went through. Went through all the murders, the wars, the terrorism, the rapes, the hangings, the imprisonment, the banishment, and then a lot of us were even branded, especially males, were even branded and shipped up out of here to other places. Not only here in South America, but over in European and West Africa and even Middle Eastern markets. That's in what's called the Columbian Exchange. And it was not just plants and animals and food either. You see. The whole basis of our oppression here was based again on religions, races, war and terrorism, based on supremacist issues and doctrine that one group of people and their culture and their so-called God law law say. Or, or, or their peoples and all was better than anybody else's. Especially when you're bringing them from, from the Eastern continents like Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. You see, this is what needs to be straightened out here. And those of us who do have those bloodlines, we don't want to take your identity away from you. those of us who do have those bloodlines, the, the foreign bloodlines and all, in spite of the intermixtures here, because even our population, I will, I will tell you, uh, the indigenous uh, Americans, the indigenous black Americans, we're still at least 60 to 65 percent of the majority of this population here. And so those of, of you all with foreign bloodlines, you all don't want to do that you know, for us and then do it for those back over there that you left behind over there, because you look at them continents now, Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, they're still tore up, they're still in turmoil behind some of the very things that we're going through now, and some of the very things that I'm discussing here, you know, or that I'm speaking on, rather. So that ends this, this brief, brief, brief podcast today. And it will be continued, though, of course. And We'll get to where we can uh, do it much, much, much longer, you know, than, than, than 
just a little short presentation here, you know. So, and in that regards, for the families, you use the share with your words. So the nailing. And until we meet again, don't need, don't know to go, I need. And also, for you watching here, thank you for your time. Whether if it's important to you, it's important to us too. Why do you?